Do aliens exist and are they among us? Are weird creatures lurking in the darkness? Do evil entities hide in the shadows of your bedroom while you sleep? Join us as we explore all this and more on the Warped Reality Podcast. <laughs> What's going on all you crazy ghost enthusiasts out there? It's your boy Ghost Joe. Welcome to episode 7 of the Warped Reality Podcast. Thank you guys very much for joining me. I have an awesome show for you guys tonight. Um, in a few minutes, we will check out an interview that I did with Miss Eleanor Wagner. She is the founder of the Lady Ghostbusters group out of New Jersey, a podcaster, author, and just an awesome, awesome person. You're going to love some of the stories she had and some of the great things she had said. So please stay tuned to that. So let's get on with some I read it on Reddit. This one's entitled The Poltergeist in My Apartment. I moved into an apartment a few years ago. It was a bachelor pad that didn't have much in it. I used it primarily as a place to sleep and put things. I was working a ton and had an active social life, so I wasn't there much to experience stuff. My girlfriend moved in with me at the beginning of the pandemic. She was living at home, and I had my own place, so I just thought it was natural for her to move in so we could spend time together. A lot of strange stuff started happening when she moved in, however. It all started one day when I walked into the bathroom with our cat trotting behind me. The cat likes to drink water from the faucet, so I usually run the water while I use the restroom so she can drink. When she walked into the bathroom, she let out a tortured yelp and ran into the living room under the couch and wouldn't come out. She stayed there for a while before finally coming out. I made a joke about it, saying, Hey, I think Mittens saw a ghost. And as I said the word ghost, my girlfriend's artist easel shifted, throwing her canvas off. This was very strange because her easel is very expensive and build very well. All the knobs had been tightened so that it couldn't move on its axis. It had also been staying in its spot for a while, a few days, so it should have settled by then. I kind of blew it off like nothing, uh, a weird coincidence. Later that night, I was in bed with my girlfriend and the cat when I heard a massive crash. I ran into the kitchen to find the trash can on the floor. It's across the kitchen, maybe 15 feet away. Our cat was with us on my lap, to be exact, and as we all know, things don't move without outside force, especially flying across the room. I picked it up, but a chill ran down my spine. Back in bed, I was finally sta starting to doze when I heard another crash. I ran into the living room and I felt like I was in a movie. Every picture hanging in the living room started falling from the wall one right after another, in a clockwise way. I was terrified. I ran into the bedroom and just tried to forget about it. Weird things like this happen all the time, especially when we say the word ghost. The string lights will fall, or the room gets very cold. A lot of weird things fall, even though they were secure for weeks or months. It's just strange. That night was really spooky. All right, guys, so the next thing I'd like to uh, do for you is play you a voicemail that I had received from a Mr. William David Pritchard. Um, he had actually uh, a lot of stories, but um, I'm going to cut it down, and I, I, uh, I'm just going to use the first couple, and I'll sprinkle some uh, throughout the next few shows. Uh, very interesting stories, and I'm sure you guys are going to like it. So check it out. Hey, this is William David Pritchard. So I've got like uh, four or five different stories that I could tell. Uh, but I'll go ahead and go with the first one. Uh, like I said in the post, my dad used to wake my uh, deaf and mute brother up by shaking his leg. And he told me that uh, it was about a year maybe after dad died that he felt dad shake his leg. And then he saw dad and I, I of course, if my young brother, he's got a vivid imagination being um, about uh, 5 to 6% autistic, I didn't think anything of it, you know, possibly just imagination, until it happened to me. My wife and I were spending the night in that room, and about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, the door opened. Um, somebody shook my leg, and I woke up, and I saw my dad 
turned around and disappeared down the hallway. Now, that's just one story that I've got. Another story is a conversation I have with the ghost in downtown San Antonio, right in, right in front of the Sheridan Gunter Hotel. Now, if you're not familiar with that, back in 1968, Walter Emmerich uh, murdered a young blonde woman um, in room 636. It was a grisly murder, unsolved to this day. I had a conversation, brief conversation with a, with a blonde woman, uh, over. Uh, and, uh, the conversation took a very strange turn and, uh, she, uh, ran in front of me and disappeared. I saw her about an hour later running across the street and all I saw was a torso, no legs, and she turned into a puff of smoke and disappeared into the sidewalk. Another ghost story that I have was in Dodge City, Kansas. We were uh, vacationing with some family members. This was in about 1989, 1990, I guess. And uh, we were on Main Street, Dodge City, Kansas. And it is just like it was back in the uh, Wild West days. And I saw a ghost appear in a dust storm. It had it, it had a red vest on. It had um, a cowboy hat on. A uh, red handlebar mustache, but what caught me the most was the eyes. We locked eyes for about five or ten minutes, and it just slowly disappeared, and the dust storm went away. Uh, I asked some people about it, and they said that uh, yeah, he's harmless. But uh, I got the I got the uh, feeling that if he was alive, I probably would have been dead. Wow, amazing story, man. Um, I don't know if I would be as calm and collected as. Uh, as you sound talking about the uh, experience, because that sounds uh, quite frightening, if you ask me. But uh, thanks again for uh, your voicemails, and I can't wait for everybody to hear all of the rest of them. And keep them coming, too. Um, also, and guys, listen, I need more submissions, so please utilize that phone number in the voicemail, 845-379-1331, ghostjoeny at gmail.com, and leave me some stories, man. That's all I'm asking. Is that so much to ask? And now we're heading towards one of my favorite parts of the show, April's Creepy Corner. So check this out. Hello, spooky friends. This is April's Creepy Corner, and in this episode, we are talking all about insane but true horror stories that were actually reported in the news. Real terror happens around us every day. Murders, disappearances, demonic possession, and devil worship. They aren't just stories from a writer's mind, but rather actual headlines. Case number one. In August 2016, in North London, 26-year-old Kennedy Eiff began acting aggressive and strange, following a pain in his throat. He complained of a python inside of him, and he bit his father and threatened to cut off his own penis. His family restrained him to a bed with cable ties and attempted to cure him with prayer for the next three days. Kennedy appeared to develop breathing issues and was pronounced dead when the brother finally called emergency services. All seven family members were accused of manslaughter, false imprisonment, and allowing the death of an adult. Post-mortem examination showed 60 wounds and bites on Kennedy's body. Eventually, all the family members were cleared of charges. Case number two. After moving into their million-dollar dream home, a New Jersey family started getting really creepy death threats from an individual who identified themselves as the Watcher. The Watcher claimed that the home was subject of his family for years and that he was in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. Another letter asked if they had found what was in the walls yet. The letters became more threatening, saying things like, I've been watching you and your children, and am happy for the new young blood that you've brought to me. The family was forced to flee their home, and later they filed a lawsuit against the previous owners. Case number three. In 2007, ABC News documented a series of cell phone calls to families with terrifyingly specific death threats. The callers knew what the families were wearing and what they were doing. The calls came in at all hours of the night and threatened to kill their kids, their pets, and their family members. Voicemails would come in, playing recordings of their private conversations and even ones that they had with police detectives. This went on for months, and every time the police traced the calls, it just went right back to the family's own phones. This was actually never resolved. 
Case number four. The Indianapolis Star published a lengthy report on a family terrorized by three children allegedly possessed by demons. The children were reported to climb up walls, get thrown across rooms, and threaten doctors who saw them in a deep and unnatural voice. There were almost 800 official pages of reports obtained by the Indianapolis Star and recounted in more than a dozen interviews with police, DCS personnel, psychologists, and even a Catholic priest. One report said that the nine-year-old son had a strange grin on his face, and he walked backwards up a wall to the ceiling. The 12-year-old told health professionals that she felt like she was being choked and held down. She claimed she heard a voice that said she wouldn't live another 20 minutes or even ever see her family again. Case number five. A Disney's Frozen Elsa doll that was gifted in Christmas of 2013 in the Houston area made headlines when it became haunted. For two years, the doll sang in English and suddenly began to alternate between Spanish and English without ever being touched. They said it sang even when turned off and even when the batteries were taken out. They threw the doll away in December 2019, but weeks later they found it sitting in their living room. Then they double-bagged the doll and put it out for the trash. They saw it with their own eyes being picked up and taken away in the garbage truck. The family went on a much-needed vacation, and when they arrived back home, Elsa had come back too. She was waiting in their backyard for them. They mailed the doll to a friend with a curiosity for the paranormal, and he attached the doll to the front bumper of his truck, where she still remains today. Wow, talk about not wanting to let it go. The strange and weird coexists alongside of us every second of every day. If you have any strange stories, please give us a call or email ghostjoeny at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening, and stay spooky. Thank you so much for that awesome segment, April. And now, guys, I'd like you to listen to the interview that I had with Miss Eleanor Wagner. She is a podcaster. She is an author. She is the founder of Lady Ghostbusters and Paranormal Investigator. Check it out, everybody. So, Eleanor, you're the founder of the Lady Ghostbusters. Can you tell me a little bit about the group? Sure. Back in 2019, when I was writing my book, I was given the opportunity to bring a paranormal investigative team into the Sterling Hill Mines in Ogdensburg, New Jersey. You know how one place leads you to another place and one person leads you to another person. Well, I got to talking to the president of the mines and we were having this conversation about the paranormal activity going on in, in the mines and I was going to write a chapter on it. And he's like, oh, I'm a scientist and I'm not supposed to believe any of this stuff is going on, but I can't explain what's happening. He said, but if you want to bring your paranormal team in, I'll let you come in here. You can spend the night. And I was like, oh, great. Thanks. And I didn't have a paranormal investigative team. So I'm like, oh, shit, now I got to come up with a team. So I often go on weekend joints with girlfriends of mine. We'll go one week into one place, one week into another. And then you kind of meet paranormal teams on the way. And there was one that I had met when I had gone to Burn Bray Mansion in Glen Spay, New York. And I thought, well, we become friends on Facebook. Let me reach out to a couple of them and see if they want to come to the mines with me. And so they agreed. Then I thought, well, I've been interviewing these people for the books. And there were a lot of very interesting, gifted individuals. Let me see if any of them. And I said, do you guys want to come to the mines for paranormal investigation? And out of the five, three women agreed. So I had three women that I interviewed and about three people from the paranormal team. And we went into the mines that uh, February 22nd, it was my birthday, 2019. I did it my birthday weekend, so it was my fun thing to do. And ever since then, I've had these women stay with me since then. And some of those paranormal team members actually started coming to the Lady Ghostbuster team. And now we're about 20 people big. We don't all go on investigations at the same time because who wants 20 people on an investigation? But I'll schedule investigations. I'll post it on our page say who's in and then I kind of give it a cutoff at a certain number if I know the building's like three stories we can have more people there and spread out it's a different story but if it's a small location I keep it down to a minimum and kind of play it by ear but that's how it all started 
So what kind of investigations do you do? Do you do residential, abandoned stuff? Do you do commercial? Uh, what, what kind of investigations? A little bit of both. To, to date, we've done investigations in known haunted locations, abandoned buildings. But with the success of the Sussex County Hauntings books, calls have been coming in and emails have been coming in from people saying, can you come to our home because we've got stuff going on? We don't know what it is. Or can you come to the business and, and help us out? So a lot of that has turned into investigations, which ultimately ended up turning into chapters and in, in books. So we've gone around the county, outside the county, depends on where we get calls for investigations to bring the team. And, and your group titles, I, I was looking at your website and your group titles, everybody with like the title Ghostbuster. Do you guys actually try to rid the area of, of spiritual uh, activity or do you just kind of investigate it and, you know, debunk it and try and tell people what they have? The initial group started out as a bunch of ladies. So Lady Ghostbusters was kind of the tag. And it's just a a fun name, really. None of us consider ourselves Ghostbusters per se, because we have no fear of ghosts and we have total respect for spirit. Realistically, I prefer to be considered paranormal, paranormal investigator, um, where we have communication with spirit to get to their message. For me personally, I believe I can speak to the team as well, that we work with spirit to decipher their message. And then we strive to find out if the spirit is stuck and if they want to move on, because they can sometimes miss that window of light into heaven, such as through a tragic death, or they don't know they're dead. Children can be very scared. It it is said that that window of light is there. But if somebody has died tragically, they don't know they're dead. And so they'll wander around aimlessly and miss it before it closes. And so they, in turn, end up being stuck. And with a child, it would just be that they're afraid because they don't know that they're dead. So if we're on an investigation, we're never going to just immediately say, you can't be here. Because they're there because it's a familiar place. They might want to stay or they're stuck. So we kind of with the mediums work together to try and make contact with the spirit and see what their story is, what their message is. And if they are stuck and they want to leave, we'll help them to go. But if they're not and they want to stay there, we want to find out exactly what's going on in each specific case. And we want to work with it to make it a comfortable situation with the homeowner or the business owner, because most of the time the people that are there are not really afraid of the spirit that's in there, very rarely are they. And then if you can get them to accept one another and work with each other, then that's great if they want to stay. Um, Now, do you just deal basically with uh, deceased spirits or have you dealt with demonic and poltergeist activity? Have you, have you dealt with that yet? To date, we've only worked with deceased spirits. Some of them not so nice, but nothing demonic, no poltergeists. I actually have no desire to work with poltergeists or demons because you can bring stuff home i mean even just going on regular paranormal investigations every now and again i'll come home with something not in a long time though because i've taken precautions to prevent that from happening but in the beginning when i first started doing the investigating i ended up having sleep paralysis and my daughter was having it and it freaked her out. So I was like, okay, I have to find out what I can do to protect myself. So I ended up getting a lot of protective stones. I actually wear um, quartz all the time. I what can see on a chain. Um, I do sage the house every couple of months, I would say. If I start to feel something, obviously I'm going to do it sooner than later. But I take every proportion that I can to make sure that I don't take anything home with me. So the last thing I want to deal with yeah, is something absolutely. that's, you know, especially that I, I'm not equipped to. I mean, I have people on my team that have been doing this for 40 years and they know what that's all about and they don't even want to touch it. Right, so right. it's kind of like, eh, stay away from it if you can. What were some of your favorite investigations? Have Have you ever experienced anything like real scary, you know, while on your investigation? Well, the, the, my favorite ones are the ones that, the, that are the most 
unexpected, I think, because when you go on an investigation and you get called in, you're getting called in because they're having stuff going on and you're never going to know exactly what to expect when you get there. Usually when we get a call to come in, we'll go and we will get activity. If we're just going to a building because it's known to be haunted, we could be there for four or five hours and nothing can happen. There have been times we've been there for four or five hours, we're getting to pack up and then all of a sudden, boom, something happens and we're there for another two hours. So it kind of depends. But the ones that I find that are my favorite ones are the ones that end up being the most poignant ones because you'll go to a residence. For example, there was this one we went to in Vernon. They were experiencing a lot of activity in the house. Now, just because a house isn't old doesn't mean that it can't be haunted because the property itself is old. So whatever was on the property hundreds of years ago, that's not there anymore. You put a new house on it, it can be haunted. So this family is in a, in a fairly new home and they're having this activity. The children are seeing apparitions, which is quite common that young kids are going to pick up on stuff and see them. They'll start playing with invisible friends to the adults, but they're actual apparitions of children that they're playing with. So they call us in because they want us to figure out what's going on. The, the little kids are seeing this little boy. So we're going there and we're going to find out what this what this little boy is trying to tell them or why he's there, what happened to him. And as I go in with these women who are mediums, everyone's got their own little gift. So they're going to pick up on other things that they're not expecting. And we get the feeling that there is a family member that's trying to come through into the home and get their attention. But obviously they're not picking up on it because they're not sensitive to that extent. So we're downstairs in the basement. Now, this is after we've been through the whole house and we've already established there is a little boy who was once a slave on the farm and he died in an accident and that's who's playing with the children. We want to figure out who this family member is that's trying to come through. And the family was thinking that it might be the grandfather who died the year before because it's the only person that they could really think of that they had a really close connection with that died not too soon before and might want to come through, especially since it was like a conflict in the family. When he was sick, who was going to take care of him? That kind of all causes issues to come up and it would be a logical reason why he might want to come through to them after in death. So we're downstairs in the basement And we're over by the pool table and we see an American flag on the floor. And all of us like, how did the flag get on the floor? Let's pick that up. It shouldn't be on the floor. All that whole pride thing. So we pick up the American flag. You see guys, see us women. We're running over there, picking up this flag. Let's fold it really nice and let's put it on the pool table. That must have been the, the trigger for this spirit because the fact that we took such care with the American flag brought all of a sudden this this activity coming into the room. And it kind of made sense because the deceased loved one was in the military and he was very proud of his country and his flag. So the fact that we found that flag on the floor and took such care of it, I'm certain was the trigger for him making contact with us. Hmm. And we like to use flashlights every now and then on and you, you loosen the, uh, with the, when you take them, when you unroll them to get to the battery, if you tighten it, it'll keep it in there. But if you loosen it, it is a, a good way for a spirit to turn the light on and off. It makes it a little easier for them. Of course, people are going to be, well, you know, is it real? Is it not? So this is what we were going through. We put the flashlight there and it kept going on and off while we were having a conversation with spirit. So of course, one of my team members who likes to debunk stuff and she doesn't, she has to be like, it has to be smack in her face before she'll actually believe it. She's telling it, no, the flashlight I think is just doing it on its own. I don't believe it's real, blah, blah, blah. So we keep on doing it and it keeps on happening, keeps on responding to us by turning the light on and off. And she's got the audio going this whole time. And she goes, I I really don't trust the flashlight thing. I'm sorry. And I don't think anything's going to happen. We've been here 
this whole time and nothing's happened until now. We're thinking that something's happened. And she says, I think we should just call it a night. So I said, okay, well, before we call it a night, let's just tell spirit that we're going to get ready to go. And that this, this is your last opportunity to make contact with us if you want to. So she says, all right, spirit, whoever you are, you have this last opportunity to come through to us. You know, I have the audio here. You can speak to it. If you say something to us, I'll do a jig and dance for you right here, right now. And we start packing up to go. And she goes, wait a second. You know what? I have this new recorder that I can actually listen back right now and we can hear if we hear anything. Let me just stop a moment and see if I got anything. So she stops and she rewinds it and she listens and she's got these special headphones, I guess, that she can hear and clearer. And she goes, oh my God. And we're like, what? She goes, I got something. I'm like, what do you mean you got something? She says, listen, listen. So she pulls it out for us to listen to. And the spirit says, um, tell them I love them. Now dance. <laughs> so when, when I heard it, when she played it, I was like, oh my God. And we start dancing around <laughs> on the floor. Us crazy women, because, you know, he said this. So we were like, okay, we got to go upstairs and tell the family. Now we have to let them listen to this because the spirit's voice in death is going to be the same as it was in life. So they're going to recognize it. And there was also ironically enough in the audio, just before the man spoke, a dog barked, but we really didn't think anything of it because the family has two dogs and the neighbor's dog was coming onto their property. So we really thought it was just a coincidence that maybe the dog barked at the same moment that the audio came through. But I don't know if you have pets or not. Dogs have distinctive barks too. I can tell which of my dogs are barking because they've got a distinctive voice. But we weren't thinking about that at the time when we went upstairs to the homeowners and we told them we've got this footage, we're very excited about it. We want you to hear it and tell us if, if it sounds familiar to you at all. And they listened to it and they were just, they were all dumbfounded first. They just were tears started flowing i can't believe it it's grandpa that's my father that's his voice and that's definitely something that he would do he was he, he was very like playful that way that he would make you dance now because he said something and she said but that dog that was barking is none of our dogs that was his dog and i said what do you mean it was his dog well his dog passed away and so i think well his dog is with him in death now but they were so excited that they got this message that he loved them and that he was still around with them and he came through and wanted us to dance. So when I, when I have something like that happen, a, another similar one we did in Lafayette, New Jersey, a family was expecting us to find some kind of ghostly activity in the home that they were experiencing. But the whole time it was the father's deceased brother. And the only reason why we went in there thinking we were going to be unearthing old ghosts was because they had found discarded tombstones on their property when they bought the house. So, you know, you always hear about bodies being displaced and tombstones being moved. And did they move these tombstones and build a house on top of the property? This is the stuff that was all going through our heads because why would they find these discarded tombstones? So we went in thinking that this is who we're gonna find is creating all this activity in the home. When all it really was, was the gentleman's brother trying to get their attention to tell them, I'm here, I'm, I'm with you, I'm watching your children grow up, because he was really making his presence known around their two daughters, their, their older daughters, college age daughters, but more specifically, the one older one, maybe he had a special connection with her, whatever it was. He was really making an effort to get her attention. And he was doing stuff like playing his, his he was a, a bluegrass musician. So he was literally playing his music in the mother's head around the house. She was hearing music. She didn't know what it was, but it wasn't, you can decipher if it's rock or if it's pop, but she knew it was bluegrass, but she didn't make the connection that her brother-in-law was a blue, bluegrass musician. So all these little nuances that you would connect and know that it was him, they just weren't clicking. And it wasn't until we actually did a session with the pendulum. I don't know if you know what a pendulum is, but it's kind of a yes and no. And then I had the medium there with us and she started getting messages from him. 
And she said, I see him in my head. I see what he looks like. If you have a picture of who you think might be trying to get through, show me the picture and I'll tell you if it's who it, who I'm seeing in my head. And she was actually describing this person and they go, oh my gosh, I think that might be your brother, honey. And they go and they grab a picture of him and they bring it over. And, and Tara's like, yep, that's who I see. That's who it is. And of course, the next thing you know, we're all crying because it's this family reunion that they weren't expecting. And the other thing that was pretty cool was that we realized, well, they realized and they told us the day that we were there was the anniversary of his death. And it, ha- wow. it hadn't clicked that. And that was no coincidence for sure. I mean, we had arranged to come the week before and it got canceled and rescheduled to that day. and it ended up being the anniversary of his death and when he was the one who was trying to come through. So those, those are my favorite investigations. There was another one we did in the brick and mortar marketplace in La- in the town of Lafayette. It was actually a known spot to be haunted. They always thought it was haunted by a little girl, that this little girl would lock people in the bathroom, hmm. mischievously playful with, and the kids would come in and they want to get locked in the bathroom because they wanted the little girl to lock them in there. We ended up finding out from our investigation that it wasn't a little girl. It was a little boy named Daniel. And Daniel was being taken care of by a gentleman by the name of Salvatore. Now, obviously, they only knew one one another in death because they had not been alive during the same time period. I'm, I'm guessing that Daniel was even before Salvatore. But Daniel in life suffered from epilepsy. So you know that anybody that had some sort of illness of that sort back in the day, they were pretty much alienated from society and kept indoors away from the public because they would be bullied and ridiculed. And who all, sometimes even people that had illnesses like that were considered witches or crazy, whatever they were marked. So Daniel in life had epilepsy and now in death, Salvatore was taking care of this little boy. Salvatore had taken his own life. He committed suicide. Why did he commit suicide? He was a gay Catholic man. Mm. And so it was understandable how he would be taking care of this little boy who was also alienated from society. Now, we wanted to try and see, were they stuck? No, Salvatore was afraid for them to go into the light because he thought that they were not going to be accepted because he was a gay Catholic and he had taken his life. So Now we had to make them understand that in the light you're accepted and there is no judgment and you would be with your beloved family members and friends who loved you in life they're waiting for you and then you can go and so we did everything we could to try and make them understand that they could go safely into the light and not be outcasted or alienated in any way and we didn't know when we left that night if it worked or not but we went back a few weeks later for another follow-up investigation and got a whole slew of other spirits that came through that night, which was a, a, another confirmed story because we got names and found their graves in the cemetery, which was really cool. But they told us that Salvatore and Daniel went into the light. So that's how we knew that we had actually succeeded in getting them over, which was really cool. Wow. Yeah, that was exciting. So you had said in your bio that you have some spiritual abilities. Uh, um what what uh, would you say is your spiritual ability? How did you become aware of it? I was young when I started seeing the ghosts that I lived with in my house. So I was sensitive to spirit then. Whether I had anything else, I didn't know. I used to call it my foofy feeling. So that's kind of stuck with me. It's a foofy feeling. I can go into a building and I feel this foofy feeling off balance. I know that something's there. I can tell if it's good or if it's bad. So that's pretty much the extent of it. And I think the reason for that is because, well, first, when I lived with this ghost, I was terrified. I was really little. 
and didn't know what it was all about. I was 10 by the time I moved down into downstairs into the basement to get away from the spirit on the main floor. So it wasn't until I was older and I understood that he was really probably just trying to get my attention. I used to call him Uncle Paul and he used to scare me. He used to come into my room, stand at the edge of my bed. I think he was just trying to get my attention, but I didn't know that as a kid. I was just terrified. And, And one time he actually grabbed a hold of me when I tried running out of the room. And that was it. It was like, oh my God, that was it. I would sleep in the room with my parents. And then when my sister got married and moved out and the room downstairs became available, I'm like, I'm going, move me down there. <clears throat> so that was that. But then I started having little premonitions, just simple things, almost like deja vu moments, but not really. They were things that were going to happen that did happen. And then one time I had this really bad nightmare about my godparents and their deaths. And I woke up screaming, ran into my parents and my mother's like, it's just a nightmare. It's not true. Don't worry about it. And then it happened. My godmother died the way I pictured she would die in the dream and my godfather as well. So I was 12 when that happened. And I blamed myself for years. Not that that was logical or realistic because you're 12 and there would have been nothing I could have done about it. but you know, to a 12 year old that dreamed it and tried telling her parent about it. And then it happened. So I feel like I probably stifled anything that I had that could have been nurtured. See, as as a parent myself, if my daughter came to me and said, I'm experiencing this, I'm the type of person that would just embrace it and make her understand it rather than have her fear it or, or poo poo it and say, it's nothing. It's It was just a nightmare. You know what I mean? If she's, my daughter is sensitive. She's had things happen to her, but she's afraid of it. So I don't encourage it. But what I'm trying to say is my mom was telling me that it was just a dream and, and that's where it left off. And it was left to me to try and understand what happened. And I was afraid and full of grief and blaming myself. So I really do think that I stifled any, Thing that may have been nurtured as the time went on until I got older and realized that the, the spirit was really just trying to get my attention and not scare me. Because if it was harmful or mean, I would have sensed it because I have that ability to sense if something's good or bad. And so now that I've picked up where I kind of left off, I'm getting better and more in tune with things as I go along. But the whole team, I look to it as we're together and I don't feel like we're together as a coincidence. I feel like we're meant to be together. I look at it as a puzzle where we each have a piece of the puzzle and we put those pieces together and we work so well together that we're able to figure out what's going on when we're on an investigation because we each have our own little gifts. And it's almost like one feeds off of the other. One will say something and then the other one will take the other piece and put it together And by the end of the night, we've got the full story. It's pretty crazy how it it, it works, but it just does. Yeah, it's it's funny you said premonitions and stuff like that. What's what's funny, I don't think I even ever said this on the podcast before, but it's what's weird with me. I mean, I've seen and, and experienced certain things, but I've had, you know, just pretty much like everybody has, you know, those premonition kind of dreams and stuff like that. But my premonition dreams are always so like, like they're, they're chaotic. Like it's weird. Like I'll have a premonition dream of me speaking to somebody about a specific subject and the sky will start falling out of the, you know, the sky will start falling. And then years or, or a couple months later, I'll be having that conversation with somebody and I'm like, Holy crap. I remember this conversation. And then I'll be looking up. I'm like, well, the sky isn't falling. <laughs> Like, I, I don't get it. <laughs> you know, like some of the some of the dream was right. And then I, I guess some of my imagination comes into the dream and, and and wants to put some crazy stuff in there. But, you know, and sometimes it, it's it's some crazy stuff, too. Like I'll be having a, a, a dream of talking to somebody, a specific person about something. And I remember in one of my dreams, somebody just came over and stabbed me and then ran away. Oh. And I, 
remember, yeah, it was weird. And then, uh, and then I was having that conversation. I'm like, all right, I got to be on guard right now because I don't know what's going to happen. You know, luckily nobody stabbed me, but I'm like, all right, I don't, I don't get my my premonition dreams. Uh, they're like they're just all over the place. <laughs> you know. Well, I can relate because that one dream, that one particular dream that I had about my godparents. Well, I'm a writer, so my imagination's constantly going. I've been writing since I was 12 years old when my seventh grade teacher inspired us in, in class. But in that dream that I had, it was a full blown movie. It was almost like a mob killing. Everybody in the family got shot except for my godmother and my godfather. And what frightened me so much was that my godfather was hanging from a rope. And my godmother was underneath a white sheet, like on a hospital bed. So I knew that there was something strange about it because it was almost so strange that they were singled out differently in death in that dream compared to everybody else in the family everybody was just shot and they were all dead and all of a sudden those two came to the forefront so i knew that yeah it was a dream that i couldn't figure out what the heck was going on because it was this big story but it was significant to them you know what i'm trying to say and mm -hmm. so like you i was trying to figure out why am I not so upset about everybody else getting shot? And I'm more upset about just the two of them and what happened to them. But I, in my head, I knew that there was a reason for it. Right. Um, well, also to, to do with that, you know, I'm, I'm from New York and you're from New Jersey. So I believe the correct term is the mafia whacked. Whacked. So. <laughs> you know, I'm from New York though, right? Oh, are you? I, okay. I was born and raised in the Bronx. Throg's oh. neck. I'm a Throg's necker right by the bridge i've spent right. more of my life in new jersey though because we we moved here not too long after we got married i'm married 32 years now so i lived in the bronx for 27 years so i'm a little bit more in new jersey than i was in new york but you can't take the new york out of me get me pissed off and you'll hear it <laughs> everybody can hear it <laughs> Same with me. That's why I could still go back to the jails and 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 talk the way I talk because I'll always be a New York City person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that island or not, I'm still New York City. Yeah. So. <laughs> um. So you had said that you're an author. Uh, you've you've penned nonfiction and fictional stuff. Uh, how many how many books have you done so far? I'm going on four. But like I said, I started I started when I was twelve. Because, not twelve. Yeah, it was seventh grade. My seventh grade teacher gave us this assignment to write poems. And the first poem I ever wrote was about Halloween and ghosts and ghouls. I actually still have it. So imagine I, my fascination with ghosts and stuff back then. And I wrote poetry for a really long time and then started on short stories, was really into the short story thing. And then I said, you know what? I had this idea for a book and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write the book. So, but I have going on four, four is coming out in a couple of weeks and with COVID and I'm not having enough people, you know, workers, it, it just, everything got put off, but Sussex County hauntings and other strange phenomena is not my first book. My very first book was actually a supernatural love story, which took place in Sussex County, where I live in New Jersey. And I wrote that back in the nineties before my kids were born. And then when I wrote it, finished it. I was accomplished, put it in a box, stuck it in the file, up in the closet, and walked away from it for all these years that I raised my children. And then it was classmates.com. I don't even know if you remember that, but it was before Facebook. And I thought, wow, that's so cool. I would love to connect with my friends from grammar school and high school. So I enrolled. And I reconnected with high school friends. And one of the guys that I was friends with had written a book. We were sharing, you know, what's been going on, how you doing? And he says he published this book. And I was thrilled for him. But the envy was like, oh, my God, he published a book. You know, I was really envious. And so I said, you know what, Mark? I said, I wrote a book, too. And he goes, you did? I said, yeah, but I didn't do anything with it. He goes, oh, my God, you got it get it out and send it to my publisher. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I got that fear of rejection because, you know, I was sending out so many things. I was getting rejection letter after rejection letter. I'm just, I don't know. He goes, get it out. So I did. I took it out of that box and I wiped off the dust 
And I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to prep these first three chapters. I'm going to send them out and find out once and for all. So I did, I sent it out six weeks later, I get a letter from them saying they want to read the rest of the manuscripts. So I was like, okay, well that's, that's progress. So I send them the whole manuscript and then they ended up publishing it. And for all intents and purposes, it was a great experience getting published by an actual publisher. Because I remember when I went to school, they had said, if you want to know if a publisher is legitimate, they're not going to ask you for any money. You, you will get published without laying out a dime. And that's how it was. And that first year I was, I was getting regular checks in the mail and I was excited about that. And then I had, at that point, I actually had sent them my children's book series and they were going to publish that. But then all of a sudden I wasn't getting anything and I was marketing myself up the kazoo and wasn't seeing anything for it. So I was getting a little annoyed because I was trying to contact them and they weren't responding to me. And I'm like, well, something's not right here. So I went online and I started contacting all the other authors on their website. And it turned out that all of the authors were having issues with getting paid. So I'm like, hmm, I don't like that. So I finally fought with them legally to get the rights to my book back because at that point now I've already been working on Sussex County hauntings and other strange phenomena and I've decided I'm going to self-publish the Sussex haunting series myself because I'm the one who's busting my ass doing all the marketing why should I send it to them and be running after their asses constantly to get paid when I can't even get paid for my first book so I ended up getting the rights back for my dream a little dream book and I republished it by myself so now I'm, an, I'm what you call an independent author. So I write the books, but I publish them myself. And I found really great success doing it. And I, I, haven't, I haven't been disappointed with it at all. I mean, in today's world, the publisher really doesn't do much for you anymore. You have to market yourself. And social media allows it to be right at your fingertips. You know, you're a writer. And I've noticed that I guess it must be you know, I, I've been playing guitar since I was 14 years old. And, and actually before that, I mean, I've always been, I can't say I've written stories and stuff, but I've always been very good at writing myself. You know, uh, if, if you told me, write, write something on a specific subject, if I research it enough, or if I know about it enough, I could write 10 pages and it'll be grammatically correct and punctuation and all that stuff and it's just it's funny because i never really learned how to do that i don't have a college degree i, I have a you know ged and all that and it's just it always came naturally to me and it's funny that you know i've noticed a lot of people that are are authors or that are musicians a lot of us have paranormal experiences you know it's it's got to be maybe something in our creative brains or something that that allows us to have that open kind of mind, you know? I don't know if you believe in reincarnation and I'm a Christian. I'm technically not supposed to, but I'm a Christian, but I do believe that we live many lives before we end up in heaven. And I feel like that's a choice that we make because it's lessons that we want to learn. And people that are creative are supposedly people that have lived before. And I find that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty creative in a lot of things. Like I'm a first soprano. So I, I, I sung for years. I write books and stories. I'm really creative with crafts and stuff like that. There are certain, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick a needle and sew anything because sewing is not my thing, but I, I excel in lots of areas and I don't have a college degree and I have a little bit of college. I did go to um, school to write for children, but that wasn't like a regular college college. And um, I just, it's almost like I'm self-taught too. It's, it's, it's a gift that I have and I've always had it. And when I can learn more about it, I take advantage of that opportunity to do so. But you're right. I do feel like a lot of creative people do have paranormal experiences or tendencies to be sensitives or mediums or psychics all in that sort of family of paranormal life I mean, and it's funny that you say that you know my last name i believe my my father had told me that the last name in italian is supposedly something like one who writes <laughs> 
which is very very strange because I'm I'm a, I'm a good writer, <laughs> you know. But uh, I, I guess I was always uh, meant to be that way. But uh, you know, I've never actually explored it too much to do that. You you might you might you might want to try it and then just surprise yourself that you no, have been able to do that. I mean, look at you 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 say you play guitar all your life and you have your own podcast. That's two creative things that a lot of people can't say that they can do or willing to do or would be able to do. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a scary kind of thing. I, I, me with the podcasting thing, I didn't think I would be able to ever do it, but I took this summer out to pick people's brains learn as much as I could online, order the equipment, download, upload, and miraculously I succeeded. But that was because I just feel like I had that ability to do it. I knew I could do it and I I did it. So that writing thing is probably in you and you'd probably surprise yourself. What's what's the name of your podcast? Eleanor Wagner's Strange and Scary World. Nice. Nice. I had to kind of tie in, well, the Sussex County hauntings and other strange phenomena. There's a story behind that. Sussex County hauntings was supposed to be just one book. And it was supposed to be about ghost stories in the county because I lived with a ghost growing up, like I said to you, but I also owned an antique shop in Sussex that was haunted. So the inspiration to write the ghost stories around the county really came from Cape May, New Jersey. I don't know if you're familiar with Cape May, but You step back in time, you step back in Victorian days when you go to Cape May, and there's all these beautiful old homes that people have just redone to their natural grandeur, and they are haunted like you have no idea. And there's always a new book out in Cape May on the hauntings in the area. So when I did my second supernatural love story, and I knew the beginning, middle, and end, but I kind of hit a rock wall and I was trying to move past it. And what usually works for a writer is you kind of divert your attention somewhere else. So the idea to write about the ghost stories that are true came into my head being inspired by the books in Cape May and my own personal experiences. So I was going to write about the Sussex County hauntings in the county, put it out on social media for feelers to see if anybody else had stories that they might want to share, because not everybody's a writer. And if I'm telling you, I'll write your story for you, you want to tell it to me, I'll put it in a compilation book with everybody's stories in the county in the different towns. And my phone did not stop dinging for weeks. Hmm. People were coming out of the woodwork. Now, this would never have happened 10 years ago because nobody wanted to talk about their ghost stories because people would think that they were crazy, right? But not anymore. People love this paranormal stuff and they want to share their stories. So it was the great, perfect time for me to do this. And people started coming out of the woodwork with their stories. But I wasn't only getting stories for Sussex County. I was getting stories for Pike County, Morris County, Passaic County. Orange County. So what I thought was going to be a book about one county is now turning into five different counties. And when Sussex County Hauntings book one was finished, I had enough stories for another book. Wow. So book two came out. And now I'm working on Sussex. And then the other strange phenomena category, that's a whole other different story in itself because it was only supposed to be about ghosts. And then people were coming to me when I was writing book one about their stories having to do with Bigfoot in Sussex County on High Point Mountain. And I was getting so many stories about Bigfoot that there was no way that I could not write a chapter on Bigfoot in the book. And it ended up being the largest chapter in the book. And so that's why I added the other strange phenomena categories so I could put the Bigfoot chapter in there. And then I was getting tons of people telling me stories about UFOs. So I couldn't write that without the other strange phenomena category. And I'm so glad I did that. I mean, it's a really long title, Sussex County Hauntings and Other Strange Phenomena. Yeah, I know it's a mouthful, but when I'm writing the other books, that other strange phenomena category opens up this whole world of stories that I could write. So where I wrote about Bigfoot and UFOs in the first book, in the second book, I took it in a totally different direction. I started writing about 
people's moments that they were with their loved ones at their time of death. And those moments are very poignant for people when they're with their loved one as they're dying and what happens while they're there and what they say and what they see and what they hear. Those were great stories. And people find such hope and joy in those stories when they read them. And then I wrote about stories when people receive messages or visits from their deceased loved ones after death, which are also very poignant stories. And now with the Warren County hauntings and other strange phenomena that's coming out in a few weeks, I use those other strange phenomena chapters to write about um, near-death experiences that people have had and what they experienced when they died and how it affected them when they came back. And some of those stories are crazy cool too. So I'm really happy that I ended up adding that into the title because it really has opened up a whole window of opportunities to write about different things that are not just ghost related. And I've, I've gotten really great responses from people. It's been received very, very well. People are very excited because the books are not just ghost stories. What I do in the books is I talk a, a little bit about the history of the towns that I'm, I'm writing about. So for example, if I'm talking about Sussex, I tell you a little bit about Sussex. And if I'm talking about the Sussex Inn, which is coming out in book three. But if I'm talking about the Sussex Inn, I'm going to tell you the history of that building, if I know anything. So you have a little bit of history about that. And then I'll tell you about what's going on. What are these people telling me is happening while they're working in this building and what they're experiencing? And then if I go in with my paranormal team, then I write about what we experienced during our investigation. And people really like that. People really like the history. Oh, and then I throw pictures in. I, I throw pictures of the, the buildings. And then I throw pictures of any evidence that we unearth or something that catches the eye. I'll put the picture in there. And then if we get video or audio, I post it on my website. So I let everybody know after they've read the book, if you want to hear the actual audio that we got from the investigation or see the photographs that we took or watch the videos of the stuff that we got. You can go on onto the website and they, the pictures are so much more vivid, obviously on the website than they are in the book. I mean, it's great to be able to see them when you read it in the book, but it's so much nicer to be able to go to the website and, and say, Oh, wow, look at that. So people get excited about that. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have, can you share a story or an excerpt from? Absolutely. I actually, you had mentioned something like that. You're not putting me on the spot at all, but yeah, I, I will. This, this is the Sussex County hauntings and other strange phenomena book. This is the first one. And I will read you from the chapter uh, about Newton, New Jersey in an assisted living facility. So you got to figure that assisted living facilities with the elderly gotta have shit going on and if you're a nurse that works in those facilities you gotta experience stuff but if you're a nurse who's sensitive to the stuff then you're really gonna sense and feel stuff so the chapter is called, uh, called assisted living deborah Zielinski has been a nurse for a very long time Besides having an important, caring, and compassionate job, there is something extra special about Deb. She's been seeing, hearing, and feeling paranormal entities ever since childhood. One can only imagine what it must be like for her to work in an assisted living facility. By 2006, she had become accustomed to seeing the Grim Reaper, although she says there's nothing really grim about him. She sees a very tall, translucent shadow in the shape of a person with a top hat and a trench coat. Most of her sightings took place along the Bender hallway. He appeared two weeks or less before someone's passing. This is how Deb knew a resident's time was almost up. She was a nurse's aide at the time, working 3 to 11 with her co-worker, Melanie. One night, they updated the girl taking over the next shift when, without warning, the Grim Reaper emerged from a room on the right. All three women saw him. Breathless, Melanie grabbed hold of Deb's hand. What was that? she asked frantically. The other girl fell to her knees and began to pray. 
She was beside herself. Deb and Melanie managed to calm her down, but she begged one of them to stay with her so she wouldn't have to work the shift alone. Two weeks to the day, the resident in that room passed away. One of the scariest experiences Deb ever had took place in the Carlson hallway. She and another girl named Jamie were in the kitchen area when they heard a resident, Gladys, screaming her head off. Ah, help me, help me, she shouted to anyone who would listen. It's going to kill me. It was unusual for Gladys to be acting this way. She was a very wealthy woman and had a corner private room with a window all to herself. She used to have servants wait on her. Gladys was not very nice and had been known on occasion to throw her toothbrush on the floor, ordering Deb to clean with it because that was all she was good for. Deb and Jamie ran to Gladys' room and stopped dead in their tracks at what they saw. The light was off. When they peered in the doorway, they saw a black, featureless, Nosferatu-like figure with tree-like limbs hovering over Gladys in her bed. The thing heard them and snapped its head in their direction. Piercing red eyes stared wickedly back at them. Deb, horrified, fumbled to flick the light switch on. The creature must have been at least six to seven feet tall, but shrunk down and slipped out the window, disappearing. Gladys looked desperately at them, You saw that, she screeched, her eyes begging for confirmation and validation. What was that? Deb and Jamie were in shock. They moved quickly into Gladys's bathroom to try and calm down. Deb began to cry. Jamie was shaking uncontrollably. What the hell was that? The light switch in the bathroom began flickering on and off. The two women watched as the switch moved itself into the on and off position. The faucet turned on and off in the spa room as well. Deb asserts it was not human, nor had it ever been. The two women did everything to calm Cladis down, even lying to convince her the incident was just a dream. Deb is convinced it was hell coming for Gladys, who passed away a few days later. Wow. <laughs> I, I actually want you to, you know what? Start over from the beginning all the way from chapter one, because you read that really, really well. I was... <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm, I, well, they say when you do podcasting that you can use the same equipment to narrate your books. So I'm thinking for the next audio book, I might do the reading myself for the last three that I had, I had a narrator do it but now that i have the equipment i think i'm going to look into it and try and do it because i actually enjoy it yeah that, that was that was great um how uh how could people get your books where could they purchase them from well my website is author eleanor if you go on there you can get signed copies directly from me but it also takes you to the link on amazon and ebay if you wanted to go that route i do have them in all the local bookstores in the area, but that's here in Sussex County. So, but yeah, you can get them at author Eleanor Wagner.com. Awesome. Awesome. Um, what, uh, what are you guys currently working on now, whether it's with your books or, or with the, uh, with the group, what are you working on at the moment? With the group, we just, I'm feeling a lot of overwhelming emotions lately with, the next book coming out and with launching the podcast and a whole bunch of other stuff going on. And then just life in general, getting back into school and not being home like we were last year. So I have just relinquished my authority on the page to one of my team members. I'm letting her take it over because I said, if you want to take it over <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, I'll just organize the investigations, I'll get the investigations, but she can, she can set them up with the people that she wants to send. It would be one less thing for me to have to worry about. So Brittany Iwanski is going to take care of the Lady Ghostbusters team page and organizing who's going to be going on investigation. So I don't have to do it anymore, but 
I'm working on Sussex County Hauntings 3 and all the interviews for the podcast. I mean, you know what it is to interview people and then editing the stuff is very time consuming. So that's what I'm working on right now. And the, and the team is working on just doing what we normally do. We took kind of September off because getting back to school and work and it was just a lot. It was really a lot. So we're starting back on investigations actually this Friday. This Friday, I'm going on a quiet investigation with just three girls. And then Saturday, we're going to an abandoned factory in Wallkill, New York. And then we'll take every weekend to go cemetery hopping and to abandoned buildings. And then we'll restart investigations per se in preferred locales in November again. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I mean, you got to do some stuff in spooky season, right? In October and all that. Well, you know what it is with me writing the books? I, I, I've I, had events every single weekend so far. I've been at book events. And then the, the week of how, the week just prior to Halloween, I'm doing a ghost tour in town for a bunch of senior citizens. So <laughs> I'm taking them around town, showing them all the ghosts once and telling them the stories. Then I'm taking them to a haunted restaurant. We're going to eat there. I'm going to tell them the story of the ghost in that building. And then I'm going to read an excerpt from the book so that's going on then. And then I have library presentations that I'm doing and book events. It's just a busy month when you write a haunting story so that they, everybody tries to get me in October. <laughs> I'm available the whole year, but I'm swamped in October. So, <laughs> so uh, how could somebody contact you or the group? You could just go right to my email, author Eleanor Wagner at gmail.com. That's the easiest and best way, because if you reach me, if you're looking for an investigative team to come into a location for an investigation, you can get that through me. And if you're looking for my books, you can get that through me. Excellent. But I'm also on Facebook, author Eleanor Wagner on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, Eleanor Wagner 22, Tumblr, author Eleanor Wagner. So there are a lot of locations where you can reach me if you needed to. Excellent. And the name of your podcast again is? Eleanor Wagner's Strange and Scary World. It's on the Paranormal UK radio network, but you can get it wherever you can get your podcasts. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll link all that in the show notes too for you. But Thank uh, you. It was actually just premiered this last Thursday, the 23rd. It was the very first episode. I'm, I'm doing a Lady Ghostbuster series. So I'm going to be interviewing each of the members on the team. And then you get to learn who they are and what their background is. But then I'm also interviewing a bunch of people who have had their own paranormal experiences, who have been in the field for a number of years, just different topics that, that go into that strange and scary same thing like the other strange phenomena kind of category. So, and it was well received so far. The first episode, everybody's really liked. So I'm excited about that. Thank you so much for, for doing this interview. It's, it was awesome talking to you and finally getting to, uh, to do the interview with you. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun talking to you. I hope you will decide to write something. If you need any help, just give me a shout out. I'll, I'll help you too. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Good night. And that'll do it for episode seven, everybody. Thank you again to Miss Eleanor Wagner for the awesome interview. Uh, thank you to April for April's Creepy Corner. And thank you to you guys, as always, the listeners. You guys are awesome. I appreciate everything you guys do. Check out WarpRealityPodcast.com. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Warp Reality Podcast. For more episodes, guest info, social media links, merch, and more, please check out WarpedRealityPodcast.com. If you have a paranormal experience you'd like to share, questions, comments, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, you can leave me a voicemail at 845-379-1331 or email me at GhostShowNY at gmail.com. You can do so anonymously if you'd like. Also, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or WorkRealityPodcast.com. Have an awesome night, everyone, and don't forget to change your shorts.